Okay, so this is the part A of chapter 23 on the urinary system. So we see a microscopic picture of a glomerulus with a uh, single arterial or afferent arterial. We'll look at organs, we'll look at functions of the system, and we'll look at urine formation and regulation. Here you have a cadaver picture. Oh, I can't get down there. There we go. Sorry. So the cadaver picture shows the abdominal organs. Here you can see the diaphragm all of this. You can see the spleen from the lymphatic system. You can see part of the liver. You can see the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta. So yes, you can tell just by looking at them because the thinner walls in the veins versus the thicker walls in the veins. It's easier to see the blood in the veins. So then you have the two kidneys You look closely, you have the ureter, which comes down here. This is the top of the urinary bladder. <clears throat> this is an important component. All of this adipose tissue, they've actually cut a lot of it out of the way. Um, this embeds um, and surrounds and cases the kidneys. And that's an important as, uh, structure that we'll name and describe. Okay. The urinary system has two kidneys, or is supposed to, two ureters, one urinary bladder, and one urethra. Most of the focus is going to be on the kidneys because that's where urine formation occurs. These other structures that all start with a U are all involved in transporting urine, which is which, where we get the name of the system, out. So urine formation is one overall function um, for the system and the kidneys is where it's formed. So the rest of these are just transportation routes to get them out of the body. And that's an aspect that um, is present because we are animals and as animals, we want to expel our waste products. So functions of the system, filtration of blood to pull out waste products and toxins. We need to get rid of the waste products. We need to get rid of the toxins. Fluid, electrolyte, and pH balance. We can dump them into urine or we can hold on to them. So, route to get rid of, route to hold on to uh, them. Regulation of blood pressure and blood volume. So, with blood pressure, oops, it's going to relate back to fluid electrolyte uh, balance, blood volume, 
fluid balance. That's in order to maintain a certain uh, pressure. Secretion of renin, erythropoietin, and prostaglandins. Renin is needed to make uh, the angiotensin II in order to regulate fluid levels. Erythropoietin is a compound necessary for producing erythrocytes and prostaglandins are gonna do various things, a lot of which are gonna relate back to fluid electrolyte and pH balance. <clears throat> Detoxifies substances. It makes them less harmful. The uh, kidneys can sometimes um, require being monitored, such as kidney function tests with certain medications. And that's because once you reach a certain volume of breakdown products, then it's gonna start damaging the kidneys. So that means you have to switch medications. So functions for the systems or for this system. Okay, nitrogenous wastes or nitrogen wastes are produced by catabolism. You need to know the waste and what's catabolized to generate them. Ammonia is produced from catabolizing amino acids. And that should make sense because this would be one end of the amino acid, the amino group, and you add on a hydrogen. Urea is produced by catabolizing proteins. Uric acid is produced by catabolizing nucleic acids. So you can put the acids together there, DNA and RNA, breaking them down. Creatinine is a byproduct of creatinine phosphate. <clears throat> Of those three, and creatinine and creatinine are different, uh, creatine or creatine um, is a breakdown of creatinine. So um, of these four most numerous waste products, nitrogenous waste products, urea, is the most numerous out of the four. So these are the top four and urea is the main one. Okay. There are a lot of bacteria and um, it's a chemical reaction, but it's also a biological reaction, metabolic reaction, because there are some organisms that can convert this but urea, the longer it sits, oops, can be broken down into ammonia. So that's why the longer ammonia stands, the, or the longer urine stands, the more ammonia you smell. Uric acid is tied to a type of arthritis called gout. If you have too much uric acid, it can crystallize and form kind of like little rocks in between your uh, bones in your joints. It can settle in any joint. In literature, it's usually the big toe. My grandmother had it in um, the distal uh, finger 
uh, so between the distal phalange and the medial phalange. Um, so those are your four most numerous waste products that we have to get rid of. Urea is less toxic than ammonia. If you think about how strong ammonia smells, if you open up a bottle of the cleaning agent, um, it can burn your nostrils. So yeah, we want to keep as much of it as urea rather than letting it sit. And it doesn't matter where it sits. If it sits in you, more ammonia. If it sits outside, more ammonia. So that's where, yeah, changing diapers quickly um, so you don't burn your skin of your child or the adult that you're taking care of. Uh, making sure we wipe it off so it doesn't accumulate. All right, so kidney. <clears throat> kidney anatomy. Now, this is a coronal section. So kind of like the heart cut in uh, anterior and posterior halves. You have the renal capsule. Now, keep in mind that the renal capsule is not completely drawn and shown here. There is a big thick layer of adipose tissue that is part of the renal capsule. So it completely envelops the kidney. The kidneys are embedded in the posterior abdominal wall. So there would be adipose tissue all the way around out here. In addition to what the arrow is pointing to, the arrow is pointing to just what we call the fibrous capsule. The renal capsule is a thick layer of adipose tissue and areolar tissue. The function of the renal capsule is to anchor and cushion the kidney. Anchor and cushion the kidney. So just like the respiratory system, you're going to have to use your lecture notes to get the functions for the structures on your lab list. Deep to the renal capsule, so it's the outer cover of the kidney. The renal cortex, on the other hand, is the outer region of the kidney. And that would be all of this. So the outer region is renal cortex. Outer cover is renal capsule. So the renal cortex is a mixture of simple squamous and simple cuboidal epithelia. So both simple squamous and simple cuboidal epithelial. The renal medulla, on the other hand, is the inner region of the kidney. all the way out here. The renal medulla is mostly simple cuboidal epithelium, but it does have some simple uh, squamous epithelium. The renal medulla or inner region includes several subdivisions. <clears throat> Within the renal medulla, you have many renal pyramids, and that's these triangular shaped structures 
They look like they have stripes and that's because they're a bundle of oops, collecting ducts. And we'll see how come the stripes are there. They drain from the edge of the cortex toward, oops, edge of the cortex towards the apex, from our base to apex. In between renal pyramids, you have renal columns. The renal columns are extensions of the renal cortex into the interior of the kidney. So they're a combination of simple cuboidal and simple squamous epithelia. The renal papilla, on the other hand, is the apex of the renal pyramid. Here you see it exposed, and here it's enclosed. This is where all of the collecting ducts converge. Oops, here we go. All of these collecting ducts are going to converge and empty at the renal papilla. So when you look at the renal papilla, there is a whole bunch of these teeny tiny little tubes that have converging at that apex. And so this is where urine formation takes place in a renal papilla. The final product is dumped into a series of tubes. So renal cortex and renal medulla is where urine formation takes place. Here, and highlighted in green again, is that renal capsule. Again, it would cover up the kidney as well, so they've cut it away. Here in the cadaver kidney, you can see the fibrous capsule out here. You can see the renal cortex. You can see renal pyramids. You can see the renal columns and the renal papilla or papilla. Okay, continuing within the kidney, you have a series of tubes. The minor calyx is a small tube with transitional epithelium, smooth muscle and elastic tissues in the middle layer and dense tissue on the outside. So this would be a minor calyx. This would be a minor calyx. This would be a minor calyx. So for every pyramid, renal pyramid, there is a minor calyx. Transitional epithelium is special because it happens to be different than typical stratified epithelium. It has two kinds of shapes, both cuboidal and squamous. So this allows for the filling and emptying of these tubes with urine. So it allows the, the membrane or the wall of the 
tube to thicken when it's empty and get stretched out and become thinner as the tube fills up. Now it's an internal, not this one, an internal diameter. Um, so it gets thicker and thinner because of the stretching. So it's a special type of epithelium tissue that is unique to the urinary tract. Unique to the urinary tract. Transitional epithelium is the inner lining of the tubes. The major calyx is a medium-sized tube with the same layers of tissue as the minor calyx or minor calyces is plural. They drain urine into the renal pelvis. So the function of minor calyces is to drain urine from the renal pyramid, renal papilla more specifically. The major calyx receives fluid from the minor calyces. And so this would be a major calyx that gets urine from three minor calyces. This would be a major calyx. The renal pelvis is the large tube. Again, same layers of tissue as the calyces. It's also going, oh my goodness. This should have a B on it, urinary bladder. And yes, you have to put the word urinary in front of the word bladder because you have another bladder that doesn't have that in front of it. And it's not the same thing. So renal pelvis is the large single tube. It's continuous with the ureter. And it's got the same tissues as the urinary bladders, the ureters, and the urethra. They're different organs because they have different thicknesses and different shapes. Now, there are two different rules of thumb for where the renal pelvis ends. So here you have renal pelvis. There are some rules of thumb where it states that the renal pelvis ends with the outline of the kidney, since it's part of the kidney. There are other rules of thumb that indicate that it ends here at the narrowest point, and so that the ureter doesn't begin until after that. So guess where I don't put the arrow? I'm not gonna put the arrow here in the middle. I'll put the arrow up here for the renal pelvis and down here for the ureter. Okay, blood circulation. He has a series of lines. They're lettered A, B, C, D but they're gonna go across A, B, C, D. You have this diagram in your book so that you can read it more accurately. This isn't the only one that we're going to use, um, but this is the bigger one of the two. So blood flow from the renal artery to the renal vein. The renal artery and vein were both on the, okay, I can live with that. We're both on your lab list for the cardiovascular. So renal artery is gonna bring blood into the kidney. It branches into several segmental arteries. Those branch into interlobar arteries. And those branch into arcuate arteries. The arcuate vessels are gonna run along the edge between the renal cortex 
and the renal medulla. Here, you can see the arcuate artery. Now they've placed it up here rather than down below, but that's just because of how they drew it. It doesn't always wind up there in the drawings. It could be on the bottom instead of the top. The arcuate arteries are gonna branch into the cortical radiate arteries, which used to be called the interlobular arteries. So the blood flow is going out. That branches into the afferent arteriole, which is this tube, emptying into the glomerulus. The glomerulus empties into the efferent arteriole, which is this tube here. And that's going to lead to a capillary bed. The name of the capillary de bed depends on if it's in the renal cortex or if it's down in the renal medulla. If the capillary bed is in the renal cortex, we call it the paratubular capillaries. And so that's all these little red and blue tubes. If, however, it's down here in the renal medulla, we call it the vasa recta. Either way, they both empty into the cortical radiate vein. And that's going to empty into the arcuate vein. The arcuate veins empty into the interlobar veins, which all converge into the renal vein. So, renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, arcuate artery into cortical radiate artery, afferent arteriole with an A into the glomerulus, which is a capillary bed, then you have the efferent with an E, efferent arterial, either to the peritubular capillary or the vasa recta. And make sure that you put a distinction about renal cortex next to where you put peritubular capillaries and re renal medulla near the vasa recta. They empty into the cortical radiate vein, which goes into the arcuate vein. The arcuate vein goes into the interlobar uh, vein, which converges and dumps into the renal vein. And that's going to empty into the inferior vena cava. So circulation of blood through the kidney. So again, you have a portal system. This is a portal system where the two capillary beds are close to each other. You have a single arterial connecting them. Now, this shows two nephron. This is one of them and this is the other one. If we go back to the big picture, that's what they're trying to show you in relationship here. You have about a million of them in each kidney.
Okay. So, circulation of blood. All right, like in the lung, you had the alveoli. In the, nef in the kidney, you have the nephron as the functional unit. Again, you have over a million nephrons in each kidney. It's composed of the renal corpuscle and the renal tubules. The renal corpuscle is the simple squamous epithelial component. It includes the glomerulus and the glomerular capsule. The glomerulus is a capillary bed that receives blood from the afferent arterial and empties blood into the efferent arterial. So A for arriving and E for exiting. Oops. A for arriving and E for exiting. Oops. Okay. So the glomerulus is part of the blood pathway, but it's also part of the nephron. The glomerular capsule here, it's opened up. So you can see inside the glomerular capsule completely envelops the glomerulus, except for where the two um, arterioles come together. It receives the filtrate from the glomerulus, and then it empties into the renal tubules, Oops, which would be here. So glomerular capsule surrounds the glomerulus. And here it's showing them open. There are some models where it looks like it's closed. The renal tubules are composed of simple cuboidal epithelium, and they're going to exchange materials with either the paratubular capillaries or the vasa recta. So here it's just showing you the nephron. Leading away from the glomerular capsule, you have the proximal convoluted tubule closest to the point of attachment, and it's not straight, meaning convoluted. Then you have the descending limb of the nephron loop. It makes a U-turn and becomes the ascending limb of the nephron loop. That flows into the distal convoluted tubule, and that empties into a collecting duct. These are the collecting ducts that make up the stripes in the renal medulla, in the renal pyramids of the renal medulla. Now, several proximal, or sorry, distal convoluted tubules empty into the same collecting duct. So you have one distal convoluted tubule coming in here. You have this one coming in here. You have another here you would have more up here. So distal convoluted tubule has a segment of it belongs to each nephron. And part of it is gonna continue down. And so all of this is gonna be smushed in together with the paratubular capillaries, the afferent and eff efferent arterioles, Phasa recta, depending on where they are. Good. 
there are four processes in urine formation. The first one is glomerular filtration. And in glomerular filtration, we're moving things out of the bloodstream and into the nephron. It tells you where it's happening and what's happening. Filtration, passive transport, tubular reabsorption, we're moving materials out of the renal tubules and back into the bloodstream. Tubular secretion, we're moving things out of the blood and into the nephron. And then water conservation, which can also be called concentrating urine. We're basically sucking the water out, oops, sucking the water out of the nephron to hold on to it and keep it in the body. So it's a back and forth process. All right, the first process is called glomerular filtration. This is the hydrostatic pressure of blood pushing water and solutes, plasma from the glomerulus into the glomerular capsule. We use the terms vascular pole, referring to the bloodstream, and urinary pole, referring to the glomerular capsule. Filtration membrane, you have one row of cells for the capillary wall. You have one row of cells for the glomerular capsule. Okay. So, again, you have a thin, so two layers of simple squamous epithelium up against each other. Vascular refers to blood, urinary, the nephron side. Okay. And that's where we're gonna end part A for urinary chapter 23. Oops, sorry. There we go.